One quick note that I'd like to add before we move into the processing of our primary transcript is that there is no proofreading activity on the RNA polymerase. DNA polymerase has its exonuclease that does proofreading and checks for errors. But RNA polymerase does not. And this means that there are errors that occur in the transcription process. The reason that this isn't of extraordinary significance is because uh, an error in the RNA is not going to be passed on to other generations. It's not heritable. And so it won't be something that is highly relevant and passed on throughout the generations. And thus, it's not called a mutation. It's simply an error in RNA transcription. The other thing that makes it not a major topic of interest is that most genes are transcribed many, many times throughout life. So an error in one of the transcription processes isn't going to be of major harm to an organism because it will only affect one prote protein that's produced and it will not be a consistent and permanent thing. Oftentimes you'll just see that gene transcribed and translated again and then you'll have the proper protein this time without the error. So there is no proofreading, but it's not something that has major negative effects on the organism as long as it's not a major thing that happens repeatedly, which requires some significant error in the RNA polymerase or something along those lines. Now we're ready to move into the processing of our primary transcript. And remember that primary transcript might be known as HNRNA, homogeneous nuclear RNA, or pre-mRNA, pre-messenger RNA. And before it's ready to exit the nucleus and go be translated, there are a series of steps that have to happen in the processing stage of transcription. The first of these is splicing. And splicing is essentially separating the exons and introns and removing all of the intron segments from our primary transcript. Remember that introns are the ones that are there and are part of the code, and I'll explain why introns are important to be passed on through generations. But introns will not ever be translated into proteins as long as this, as long as this process is going appropriately. Exons, on the other hand, are the ones that will be translated. And you can remember exons as the things that are preserved by remembering that exons will exit the nucleus to be translated and they'll be expressed. And so exons exit the nucleus for translation and are expressed. Those are the exons. Now, in order for splicing to occur, you need to form something known as a spliceosome. And a spliceosome consists of SNRNA, which is short nuclear RNA, and these may then join with some proteins to become SNRNPs, short nuclear ribonucleoproteins. And these are often referred to as SNRPs. And the SNRPs are part of something called the spliceosome, which allows us to cleave these introns and join exons together. And the way that this works is that the SNRPs will bind near the end of these exons. So you have a SNRP over here and a SNRP over there. And what will happen here is we'll have exon 2 with the SNRP right there. And then the intron will form like that. And then we'll have exon 3. So right now what we have is this whole chain, but we're focusing on the exon 2, intron 2, and exon 3 region. And what happens is that now that we have these two SNRPs here, let me just add this three. Now that we have these two SNRPs here, these SNRPs will join together and they will form what is called a spliceosome. And the spliceosome is what's going to participate in cleaving the intron part of this primary transcript and releasing it to the nucleus to be degraded. Keep in mind, this is all still occurring in the nucleus because we haven't processed it enough for these things to leave. Interesting things about splicing are that when this happens, you have a, you might hear it referred to as a loop, 
a lariat or a lasso. L-A-S-S-O. And this is essentially the loop of intron that is formed and will eventually be cleaved. And once this is cleaved, still within the nucleus, it will be degraded by enzymes known as exonucleases. And the reason they're called exonucleases is because they be, the degradation process begins at the end of this string of ribonucleotides. And so it will just degrade the introns that are no longer being used, and then you'll still have the nitrogenous bases and different components, but it won't be a functional piece of genetic material after that process has gone on. So with splicing, you have SNRPs that join near the end of the exons. They join together, and that creates a loop or lariat or lasso of intron, and then that is cleaved and degraded within the nucleus. And what that does is it ends up with exon 2 being directly joined to exon 3 now in our mRNA. Another feature of splicing that is useful is that it doesn't necessarily happen, have to happen between adjacent exons. It could be that exon 3 and exon 1 are the ones that have SNRPs. And these form a spliceosome with a large loop that includes exon 2. And this is what's known as alternative splicing. You can then have an end product that rather than going from exon 1 to 2 to 3, it can have just exon 1 and exon 3. And this underscores some of the importance of introns. This alternative splicing is part of the reason that introns are important and thus have been conserved throughout so many species and so many generations. Because of introns, we need to undergo splicing in order to get our mRNA, our official final mRNA that's translated. And introns enable alternative spl splicing patterns, and that can result in different expression of certain parts of genes. And that allows for a lot more flexibility and adaptation to environments. And so one of the major reasons that introns exist, despite not ever being translated into proteins, is that introns set the stage for alternative splicing, where we could have exon 2 and 3 uh, spliced out, and so intron 2 would leave, and we'd have 2 and 3 here. Or you could have 1 and 3 be the ones that form those spliceosomes, and then exon 2 would not be expressed, and that provides for a lot of variability. And imagine a much longer primary transcript, which you usually have. There are so many exons and so many alternative forms of splicing that that allows for a lot of variation and thus adaptation and thus something that is evolutionarily favorable can happen due to the alternative ways that you can splice different types of pre-mRNA. Another thing is that there are variable splicing sites. This is something you can encounter. Within an exon, there might be two different sites where it could be spliced. It's not likely to be tested all that much, but it is possible to have part of an exon, but not that entire exon show up in your final mRNA transcript. So just recognize that splicing is a process produced by SNRPs, which are primarily RNA, short nuclear RNA, with some proteins, and these catalyze the formation of a spliceosome that then removes introns. The splicing, because of all the different exon segments and all these introns, you can have alternative splicing where you're expressing, for example, exon 1 and 3, but not number 2. Or you could have two spliceosomes that one of them removes intron 1, the other removes intron 2, and your final product could be exon 1, exon 2, and exon 3. And so there are a lot of different ways that splicing can occur. This is still in the nucleus, and that can result in differential expression of things on our pre-mRNA, or no longer a primary transcript, but perhaps a secondary transcript. Just splicing alone isn't enough for a transcript to be ready to exit into the cytoplasm and be translated. What we need to complete the processing is we need to add two components to the ends. On the five prime end, we need to include a cap. And a cap is something that 
is a sequence of a few little biomolecules here that prevents degradation from those exonucleases. So it protects our mRNA from being degraded. And on the three prime end, we'll be adding a poly A tail. It's a group with a lot of adenine nucleotides, many of those, and those also prevent against degradation. So once the splicing has occurred and we've eliminated the introns from our primary transcript, we've added a five prime cap and a three prime poly A tail. Now we have an mRNA, a messenger RNA, that is capable of leaving the nucleus and entering the cytoplasm in order to be translated and converted into proteins. Thank you.